Okay, so this is chapter 11 video. Uh, I'm going to be walking through the final chapter of content from our textbook, Theories of Human Learning. And in this one, I'm going to um, talk through the topic is Bandura's Social Cognitive Theory. Um, I really like this theory. It's really interesting because it, um, yeah, it, he, he touches on some philosophical questions about agency and, um, and really his theory puts a lot of things together. So um, first off, Bender points out, going all the way back to operant conditioning, um, Bandura points out that operant conditioning, if it was the only explanation for our behavior, um, it, would, it would mean that we would spontaneously have to behave a certain way and then when it's reinforced, we'll continue to do it. If you recall, operant conditioning is this idea of trial and error, that we are learning how to behave based on trying out certain behaviors and then seeing if they lead to positive consequences, in which case we continue doing it, or negative consequences, in which case we, we discontinue doing it. And so um, if that was the only way that we were learning, um, that in classical conditioning, um, but um, classical conditioning seems to be different. So if we had to do trial and error for everything, there'd be a lot of things that would be very difficult for us to learn. Um, so some of these things are real simple, um, like learning how to shake hands. Well, I'd have to, the first time I, I ever shook hands, I'd have to just spontaneously reach out and shake another person's hand. And that, you know, doesn't seem all that likely just on its own, right? Um, again, this assumes, oh, there's nothing that is, um, we're, we're not able to, to watch another person and decide to do it. Uh, no, it's got to be our own experience. Now, oh, that's a simple example, but what if we're talking about something more complex about learning how to drive a car, a stick shift perhaps? How would we ever learn how to do that? Um, I, that just sounds really dangerous to think that we'd have to learn by trial and error. Oh, I, if I turn the wheel this way, I go, the, the, you know, there's so many complex behaviors that we just don't, it doesn't make sense that we'd have to learn it through trial and error. So more likely is that at least some of the behaviors that we have have been learned socially. We learn them from others. And so um, before I get any further, uh, let me explain something about social learning. Social learning can mean learning what is socially appropriate. So we can learn how to behave at weddings and how to behave at funerals, how to um, make friends, what kind of jokes we could tell with certain types of people. How do we dress in a professional setting? How do we dress at a a party. Um, but that's not exactly what we're talking about here. So um, it, it relates, but here in this chapter, we're going to talk more about learning that occurs as a result of social interaction. So how is social interaction part of the process of learning? And this is a theory that was uh, developed by Albert Bandura, another top 10 name to know in the field of psychology, probably, uh, yeah, top 10, uh, not quite at the level of B.F. Skinner, but pretty close. And, uh, okay, so a little bit of background. Uh, Bandura was uh, Canadian. He took a psychology course um, in undergraduate just as a, an elective, just to fill his schedule, and it fascinated him. He ended up uh, earning his PhD in cl clinical psychology from Iowa State University, and he developed a social cognitive theory of human behavior. And so, um, really, his theory is a theory of imitation or observational learning. It, it's really about how do we learn from the, um, the observation of others how to be behave for ourselves. And initially, Bandura was really just expanding on Skinner's theory of operant conditioning. 
Um, so he, his starting point was simply recognizing that, okay, operant conditioning does seem to explain some behaviors. And he was just thinking, how could it explain more behaviors? And, and Bandura pointed out that, um, you know, in operant conditioning, it was a, um, it was really learning, of course, that, that we come to expect certain behaviors are reinforced. And when we copy other people, we copy them because we expect the same um, uh, reinforcement to occur for us as it did for them. So we see they are reinforced for particular behaviors and we want the same for ourselves. And we wanna um, experience the same, you know, good interactions with other people, um, good consequences, um, things like that. Um, but he, so really it started as a theory of social learning, but then he expanded it and made a, a theory of social cognitive learning because he began, began to realize that cognitive activities like imagining and anticipating were really important. Okay, so let me give you a big picture. There's four main processes in observational learning. Uh, the first is attentional processes. So in order to learn through observation, in order to learn from another person's behavior, the real basic part is we have to pay attention. We cannot learn if we aren't paying attention to what their behavior is, uh, this model's behavior. The second process, um, and again, these are sort of like phases of the process, is retention. So we need to attend to some behavior and then we need to retain it and we need to remember what we observed. The third phase is motor reproduction processes. So we have to turn the memory into an action. We have to uh, see it, usually it's see it, we might hear it as well. Um, we need to keep it in memory, but then we have to be able to turn that memory into an action for ourselves. And finally, there's a motivational process where the person actually carries out the action. Um, so uh, if you're not motivated, you, you could pay attention, you could remember, you could be capable, you can have the motor capacity, but if you're not motivated, you're not gonna do it. And so um, motivation is like the key to, to proving that you've learned observationally. All right, so first off, you need to be motivated to attend to some model's behavior. Um, many behaviors are not learned because they're not closely attended to. Um, so if you're trying to um, learn how to, I don't know, it just came to mind, drive a garbage truck. Um, you, could, um, you could do a, a ride along in a garbage truck and uh, if you weren't closely paying attention, what if you're just sort of enjoying the, you know, the experience and, and thinking, oh, this is cool, I'm in a garbage truck. Um, if you weren't paying attention closely, you might not be able to reproduce what they did. Um, but if you were getting hired by the, uh, this garbage company and you were told you're doing a ride along to learn how to do this for yourself, you're gonna do this for yourself in a week's time or a couple days time, and you might be more attentive to what they're actually doing. And so, um, again, if you aren't paying attention, you're not gonna get anywhere with observational learning. And that's true in a lot of different ways. Um, the, the imitator is more likely to copy models who are attractive, trustworthy, and, pow and or powerful. Another thing we know is that if you want someone to pay attention, the person, needs to be attractive um, and that could be physically attractive but it could also be um, charismatic likable just a you know a person who is interesting uh, the the model has to be trustworthy generally um, so it has to be a person that you can rely on and and think that you're getting reliable information from and then finally powerful if the model is powerful, we're more likely to copy. And so um, th this is one of those reasons why we, on, on commercials, we often see celebrities. 
celebrities are usually attractive. Um, they're, they tend to be trustworthy in some ways. Uh, and they also seem like they're powerful people. And so when we have a celebrity in a commercial, we're more likely to buy whatever it is that they're selling or um, you know, purchase it because we think, oh, this person, well, one key thing is, is just the fact that we pay more attention and we probably assume that they are a person that is gonna give us good information. Okay, so that's the first phase. The, um, but one comment about this phase is that these models, you might think of models as, as people, and certainly they can be people, but a model can be anything, any representation of a pattern for behaving. And so that could be actually oral or written instructions. So if you think about a recipe, a recipe is a model. It is a, it, it is a representation of a um, series of, of steps that you can follow. And the, um, the steps are, the, the assumption is that the steps are going to lead you to a positive consequence. Um, and the, the steps it, it gives you is a guide for your own behavior. So you're not making uh, banana bread from just uh, trial and error, which would probably be a complete mess. You make tr banana bread following directions on a recipe and maybe, uh, of course, adapting some things uh, the way that you would like to do it. Um, so recipes are one example of this. Another, it would be um, instructions in education. So if you're writing a paper, well, um, from past experience, you know how to write words and sentences and paragraphs, but how are you ever going to write the paper that um, I want you to write if, um, if you cannot actually learn from my directions? So the fact that you are able to tailor your, your paper when uh, we professors hopefully give you good instructions, is um, is a basically an example of uh, our instructions are the model for you, um, and so that's another example. Of, and models can be mental images of um, you know what would Jesus do. Um, it could be characters in TV and, and movies. It could be computer-based training programs, and so that could be pilot training or medical instruction, things like that. Okay, the second and third phases are retention and reproduction. So first was attention, second is retention. Uh, so this is about memory and you have to retain the model's behavior either as a visual sequence. Um, so it could be watching a hurdler's technique. I was actually a hurdler in high school. Um, I, was a, I was a pretty good runner. I, ended up running in college and uh, and doing well, but I had to give up hurdling because I, I wasn't all that good at hurdling. I was good at the running in between the hurdles. And so, um, but I, I remember watching some videos on hurdling and trying to, trying to kind of um, learn from those observations about how to do it better myself. Uh, bending down low and uh, some of the drills that they suggested, things like that. Uh, so I was learning from visually attending to this video and trying it myself. Um, but sometimes it's it's verbal, right? If I gave you a series of steps to, um, you know, uh, navigate to um, the nearest Starbucks, I could say, oh, turn left, then right, then left, and it'll be on your right-hand side. And so you can actually have a, a verbal representation of it. Um, or let's say if I try to explain how to drive a manual transmission, my first car was a manual. So um, I did learn how to, to drive a manual. Um, I think people today, it's a little bit more rare, but um, again, this is a, a verbal representation. Um, maybe uh, you wanna push the clutch in with your left foot and, um, and you might uh, 
have to, well, you probably should release the gas when you do that. And you will move the gear from, let's say, second gear to third gear. And you talk about how you would do that. And so you can have a verbal representation of it. And again, the, the key is having it in your memory. So if you paid attention, but you don't retain it, then you're not going to be able to, to copy. The third phase is reproducing. And this is really about having the physical capacity to do the behavior that it's referring to. So um, the capacity to, um, if you're talking about gymnastics, I could watch gymnastics, I could pay attention, I could even keep in mind, you know, fairly closely, maybe not exactly, but fairly closely, what do they, what are they doing if I watch it enough times? Um, but if I don't have the physical capacity to do it, then I'm not going to actually be able to, to do it. Um, you know, or if it's high jump a seven foot bar, you know, that's just not going to happen. So you need to have the capacity to do it, but actually you also need the capacity to monitor and correct one's performance. So I think most of us have the, the physical capacity to shoot a basketball. So you're not limited by, um, you know, muscle strength, most likely, but you may be limited in your ability to monitor and correct your behavior um, as you're shooting a basketball. So um, if you are, um, if you get really trained on this, you actually have a, a sense where you know the speed of your arm, you know the, the, um, the strength to shoot the basketball, and you have the capacity as you're shooting to correct it and to make sure that it actually, um, you're shooting at the right strength, right, uh, right form, and you're able to, you know, more likely make it in the basket. The fourth phase is motivation. And according to Bandura, motivation to imitate must be present for the behavior to be performed. So again, you can pay attention, you can retain it, you could even have the capacity to do it, but if you're not motivated to do it, then you're not gonna do it. So you could learn CPR, you can um, pay attention, retain it, you can have the capacity to do it, but if you don't have a person who needs to be resuscitated, you're not gonna do it. <laughs> And so um, you, you won't have, for good reason, you won't have motivation to actually do it. And so you have acquired it, but you haven't performed it. And um, the, for Bandura, the motivation comes from a belief that the behavior will be reinforced. Okay, if you have a person who is unconscious, unconscious and you do CPR, uh, it may, hopefully, uh, being reinforced by bringing that person back or, or to, to um, you know, sustain them until the paramedics can arrive. Uh, but if a, a person's not, if they're fully conscious and you do CPR, you're probably going to be in big trouble. And so, um, so again, um, you're not going to be reinforced for doing CPR in that situation. Okay, so, um, Basically, the, you could talk about sources, uh, two main sources of reinforcement. Uh, direct reinforcement is where reinforcement that comes as a consequence of the imitated behavior. Um, so this is where if I do, um, if I do a behavior that is based on someone else and it, it may end up getting reinforced. It may, um, so for, an, for instance, I might watch a uh, video on how to shoot a basketball and I might follow the form and then shoot and I might make it in the basket and that's direct reinforcement. I've gotten a consequence for my behavior. Um, so that would be direct reinforcement. Vicarious reinforcement is where the model is reinforced but the imitator may not actually be reinforced directly. So the imitator may also assume that the model was reinforced even if they were not. So sometimes we, we live in ambiguous situations where there really isn't a consequence for our action, where we, we do things and we um, just sort of hope that they're gonna lead to reinforcement in the future. So, um, you know, if, 
if you think about the styles of, of clothing that we wear, um, sometimes we do wear something and we get direct reinforcement, but sometimes we, we wear something and we can't even tell if people like it or not. And, you know, sometimes we don't want to ask, um, be nosy. So, uh, you know, I might wear a, a, a new light blue shirt and, um, and I wear it because the, the model, and in this case, the literal model, uh, you know, the, the magazine model or the internet model that I, I saw wearing the shirt looked looked good when he was wearing it. And I might think, well, maybe I'll look good if I'm wearing that. And I, I buy it and I, um, I see the model being reinforced, which is basically they're, they're being reinforced because they're looking good. They're wearing the shirt and they're looking good. Um, I might not be reinforced and I might not look good on in that color. Light blue is probably not, I don't know if it's my best color. Um, so that um, the, uh, as a result, I might imitate a behavior that's reinforced for the other person, but I might um, not actually be reinforced myself. Or interestingly, the, the, we may assume the model was reinforced. They may have been doing something and we think, oh, I, I should behave like them because they got reinforced when maybe they're not being reinforced. Maybe the, the, um, they have, uh, again, maybe a celebrity who is um, trying a new diet and the diet may not actually even work for the celebrity, but they, um, the celebrity says that they're doing it and you can actually copy the celebrity and the diet that they're saying is so wonderful, but um, you're, you may not get reinforced for it. And the, the person you're imitating, the celebrity, it wasn't reinforced for it. So nobody's getting reinforced to it, but, um, but that's still vicarious reinforcement because um, there's this observation or assumption that the model was reinforced. Okay, so here's the four processes, attention, retention, motor reproduction, and motivation. So there's some modeled event. The attention is really about, is the, is the modeling stimuli, is the, uh, again, this could be a person, or it could be an internet recipe, or it could be um, a political view, um, or, it could be, yeah, it could be a, a number of different things. And to pay attention, well, what does it take? The, the stimulus that we're observing, the model needs to be distinctive, it needs to be emotional, it needs to be complex, it needs to be prevalent, it needs to be like in our, in our environment, and it needs to have some functional value. The observer needs to be capable of seeing and hearing. So if it's uh, like a, a concert and they can't hear properly, they're not gonna copy what you have to say. If they, if they literally have a visual problem, they can't see that far away, that's gonna limit them. Uh, they need to be kind of awake and aware. They need to be um, perceptually attuned. So sometimes you have to draw their attention to uh, look at the way that they're holding their back right now. Look at the way um, that they're their, their elbow, what angle their elbow is if you're learning how to shoot a basketball. Um, so sometimes you have to help the observer focus in on the right characteristics. Um, and then again, past reinforcement might be a factor too. So if you've watched videos but never learned from them, uh, you might be less motivated than if the, the videos you've watched have, have been fruitful for you learning how a new skill. Okay, and then the second phase is retention. So you need to put it into some symbolic coding. You have to cognitively organize it. You need to sort of rehearse it in terms of the motor movements. Then the third phase is motor reproduction. Again, you have to have physical capabilities. You have to have uh, component re responses. You need self-observation and accurate feedback. And then motivation, you need 
external or external reinforcement, vicarious reinforcement, and then self-reinforcement. Um, and, and those are the four processes. Okay, so Bandura point out that um, the imitation can have different effects. The first is probably the most, that, uh, the one we think about would be the modeling effect. So we could perform a new behavior, a novel behavior, as a result of observing a model. Okay, well that's, that's pretty straightforward. So we could do something because we saw someone else do it. An, another, and it's kind of a pair of effects, is uh, inhibitory and disinhibitory effects. So we could either decrease or we could increase a learned behavior as a result of observing a model. So we might, um, let's say, we, we, we see people, uh, guys wearing pink shirts, and I might be more likely to wear a pink shirt. Be, um, I might have a pink shirt, and I might be more likely to wear it because I see guys everywhere wearing pink shirts. Um, or maybe I could watch others and say, oh, that guy sort of got laughed at because he was wearing a pink shirt and I might be inhibited for wearing a pink shirt because of watching a model. So again, inhibitory, disinhibitory, can, it might not be a new behavior, um, but I can increase my engagement in it or I can decrease my engagement in it based on watching others. The third possible effect is the eliciting effect. We could actually perform a behavior that is similar, but not exactly the same to the one observed in a model. So we could do something close to what they do, uh, sort of inspired by what they did, but it could be our own. So here's some uh, examples of that. So modeling effect while well, smoking. Uh, if you saw a friend smoke a cigarette or a vape, because um, that's all the all the rage these days, uh, we might ourselves model that and actually try out smoking a vape um, for the first time after we've seen someone else do it. An inhibitory effect we could, um, if we saw, let's say, Billy get punished for throwing rocks, we might stop throwing rocks. Uh, disinhibitory effect, if we, if we see another car go speeding past us, we might actually drive a little faster. We might, uh, you know, it's not a new behavior. We've probably driven fast before, but we might be more likely to dr drive fast if we see so another car doing it. And then the eliciting effect, uh, let's say if you um, saw a game of Texas Hold'em on TV, um, there was a phase that I got into wa enjoying watching that back in I don't know, college or, or, or early graduate school, I, I really liked watching Texas Hold'em on TV. And um, let's say if I ended up playing blackjack, it's a different game, but it's a card game, that'd be an eliciting effect. Okay. Um, oh, now the, um, the study, and I, I uh, hid the, the link from, the, the slide deck because I give you a video that um, uh, you may have seen before. It's Bandura's Bobo doll experiment. And uh, well, let me let me explain it to you real quick. Um, and it goes a little bit before this uh, this data right here. So you may have heard about the Bobo doll experiment. There is this Bobo doll, which is like an inflatable clown that um, if you knock, if you hit, it will fall back and come back up. And the um, in Bandura's study, he brought kids in, and they came in with their parents. Uh, they sat in a waiting room, and in the waiting room there was a, a window where they could see through and see this uh, play area. Before they went into the play area, they uh, there was a graduate student who would go in and in some cases would actually be physically aggressive to the Bobo doll. In some cases would be verbally aggressive to the Bobo doll. And then in some cases would play with the Bobo doll but not be aggressive at all. And um, so the, uh, the kids would then go in 
and play with the Bobo doll. And if they had an aggressive model, the uh, aggressive model, uh, they would often imitate the physical aggression. They'd be, they'd be physically aggressive towards the Bobo doll exactly in the same ways that the graduate student uh, was this, um, this model. And they would be uh, verbally aggressive and say, oh, I'm gonna kill you uh, or something like that in exactly the same words as the graduate student. And those who didn't see the aggressive model, they weren't physically aggressive. They weren't verbally aggressive. Well, they weren't very much physically aggressive. They weren't very much verbally aggressive. Um, but they would actually um, still play with all the materials. And so you could see in the data there, big gaps. In blue, you have the aggressive model. In red, you have the non-aggressive model. And then in green, you have the control group uh, where there was no model. So, oh, sorry. Um, so you could see huge differences between the behaviors of those who had aggressive models and those who didn't. So clearly the children were learning something even while they were just observing. They were, their, their behavior changed as a result of observation. And again, seems very straightforward, very obvious to us, but in terms of science, uh, this is 1961, uh, the science of psychology, it, they didn't really have a, a place to account for observational learning. And I do encourage you to actually watch the video. I, I uh, posted the YouTube on the multimedia page, so um, it's probably on the same page you're watching this video on. And I encourage you to to check that out because that's a um, it's it's interesting to actually see it in action. Now later on. Excuse me. Later on, Bandura became more interested in cognitive determinants of behavior. Now, we already talked about one of these. Um, he talked about self-efficacy. So self-efficacy was about your, your beliefs about your own abilities. That if you believe your ability will um, lead to good performance, then it's more likely that you will uh, behave that way. Um, and, and so he said, we're guided by our belief systems. Bandura pointed out that, that people believe, uh, people strive to control events that affect them. He called this reciprocal determinism. Uh, and it's really interesting because the environment controls the person, right? And that is, that is classical conditioning and operant conditioning that our behavior is the product of our environment. But also, interestingly, uh, the person is trying to control their environment. So they're act, trying to make an effect on their environment, trying to elicit good consequences from their environment. And so he came up with what he called uh, behavior control systems. Um, so he, he said behavior cannot be explained entirely by external events. And it couldn't, in the same way, be explained entirely by internal events, which would be cognitivism. So humans, and I just said this, humans are affected by their environment, but they're also affected by their thoughts and cognitive processes. So he's not trying to get rid of behaviorism, and he's certainly not trying to get rid of cognitivism. Uh, in many ways, he is a cognitivist, but he's trying to, to think about how do we put this all together? And again, this is what I like about this chapter. It actually helps you put things together um, because uh, he, he, he actually said there's three types of control systems for our behaviors. Some behaviors that we do are, are directly under the control of stimuli. And that would be like classical conditioning. If I salivate in response to a you know, lasagna that is cooking with garlic and cheese, um, getting hungry as I, I talk about it. Uh, but my behavior, my salivation is directly under the control of that, those stimuli, the smells, the 
the taste, the, uh, the sights. And, um, and so I'm under stimulus control in that situation. It also includes behaviors under the control of discriminative stimuli in operant conditioning. So again, if there's a cop nearby, I'm under stimulus control because if I'm uh, worried about getting pulled over, I'm gonna not drive uh, excessively fast and I'm, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna be very careful about my behavior. And again, I, in, in that situation, my, my behavior is being controlled by a stimulus in my environment. If I'm trying to impress a, uh, a girl that I'm interested in, uh, I'm under stimulus control. I'm trying to, um, my behavior is, in a sense, directly under the control of, of the stimuli, the, this girl that I'm interested in, if she's watching me. Um, then some behaviors are the result of outcome control. This is where our behavior can be controlled by the reinforcers or, or punishers. And this is really operant conditioning, okay? So nothing uh, too interesting there. Um, so Bender is just pointing out that sometimes we're just behaving because we our behaviors have a certain outcome. Um, and then finally, some of our behaviors sim under symbolic control. And this is where our a certain human activity is controlled by mediating cognitive processes, such as self-instructions, imagining consequences, um, and sometimes imagining consequences years in advance. So those of you taking this uh, as a class, oftentimes um, there's no direct stimulus control. Someone saying, take this class or, uh, you know, I'll get you. Um, you know, there's no direct outcome control. You're not probably... Uh, you, you may enjoy some of the content, but writing a paper is usually not all that uh, reinforcing. But more likely, you're under symbolic control, that you're imagining having that degree, or you're imagining applying this in a real situation, like in clinical work. And when, you, um, when your behavior is guided by that, that is symbolic control. So you're, um, your cognitive processes are guiding your behaviors. And uh, Bandura, a quote, the remarkable flexibility of symbolization enables people to create ideas that transcend their experience. So sometimes we're not actually behaving in ways that are um, for our own benefit, uh, directly, immediate benefit, I should say. Sometimes we're not behaving because of certain stimuli. Sometimes we're behaving in certain ways because there's ideas that, uh, that we hold, that we hold dear sometimes, that say, uh, that sort of dictate our behaviors. Um, so a lot of, uh, well, sometimes people accuse religion of being stimulus control or outcome control, but oftentimes um, religion and spirituality and our faith it's symbolic control. There, there's these um, ideas of um, ethics and uh, consequences for our behavior and, and uh, sort of participating in God's work, things like that, that guides us to behave the way that we behave. All right, so stimulus control, uh, just to unpack this a little bit further, is where behaviors are controlled directly by antecedent conditions. So antecedent are the environmental conditions before we behave. Um, so uh, these can be reflexes and classically conditioned responses. So you had uh, little Albert crying when he sees a white rat. And then we had um, outcome control. This is where behaviors are controlled by their consequences. Again, this is operant conditioning. Um, so uh, Sarah has occasionally won a small jackpot and as a result, she plugs dollar after dollar into the slot machine until she's broke. Um, symbolic control is where behaviors are controlled by thought processes, such as the ability to visualize and anticipate. And so um, uh, this is where behaviors without immediate rewards, but are associated with anticipation of long-term rewards. So Edward studies like a fiend all week, hoping to ace the exam and win a scholarship. So just the, the one week ahead of being able to 
do well on this exam. Um, and then the maybe the year and ahead to win the scholarship was the motivators. And so the symbolic control of like, oh, I want to get this pass this exam and I want to get this scholarship. And that was the motivation, no force on his behavior. And all this comes back to an idea that we've um, touched on throughout the course, which is, um, are people agents of their own actions? And the behavior is really, either they ignored it or they actually um, minimized it. The behaviors were really arguing that in terms of science, um, we cannot answer a question of like agency um, because they limited their their scope to only what is observable. And again, the, the cognitivists opened it up a little bit further, but um, but Bandura really put it into um, a structured understanding of it. So uh, Bandura argued there's three main features of human agency. First is intentionality. So having purpose of action. Uh, so if we do something, we have a purpose for the, the doing of that action and that's a part of human agency the second part is forethought planning and anticipation so we uh, foresee the consequences of our action and we plan it out and then uh, finally there's a self-reactiveness and self-reflection after imagining imagining an action and its consequences people can react to their own, own intentions uh, so sometimes we think about, oh, what if I cheated on this exam? But then we think about that and say, wow, you know, I would feel probably feel guilty. Um, I would probably feel like even though I got a grade I wanted, I wouldn't feel right about it. I would feel, um, again, guilt. I would feel that I don't deserve it. So it probably wouldn't feel so sweet. I probably... And so that sort of self-reactiveness is part of our human agency. Okay, now, uh, a part of this is this idea of reciprocal determinism. Not only do we anticipate the consequences of our behavior and govern our, ourselves accordingly, but we also often deliberately shape our environments. So if we're thinking about, you know, are we agents? Well, the behaviorist really pointed out that our environment shapes our us and our behavior. But reciprocal determinism says, okay, that's true. We should take that into account, but we also affect our environment. We have an impact on our, on our environment. If you think about other people, um, well, are other people nice to you? Well, to be put in frank, uh, people are probably gonna be nicer to you if you're nicer to them. And so your um, your emotional state, if you're if you're kind of nasty and mean, the other person will probably treat you nasty and mean, which in turn will probably make you frustrated and maybe a little bit more mean. And there's this uh, back and forth escalation of the uh, negative state. Um, but reciprocal determinism suggests that sometimes we can actually affect our environment. And so if someone's mean to us, then we're kind to them. Then maybe instead of it getting worse and like yelling at each other, we can actually, um, uh, if I respond differently and I can have an impact on them and, and it doesn't need to go that way. So um, in terms of reciprocal determinism, there are factors, um, and and the behaviors really pointed out how this bo bottom two, the social and physical environment, and the behaviors, the arrow is only going this direction. Our environment shapes our behavior. And like I just said, we could also say, well, um, behavior shapes our environment. But then you could also add in personal um, personal uh, internal factors like biology. Uh, what's your what's your sex? What's your gender? What's your ho hormones? Uh, your affect, which are emotions or moods, and your your cognitions, your knowledge, your goals, your expectations, 
And that can shape your behavior. Um, you know, the way you, you feel, um, your biology can shape your behavior, your emotions can shape your behavior and your, your thoughts. And then your behavior can actually shape your, um, your hormones, for instance. So if you are aggressive, your level of testosterone can increase and your, um, well, certainly if you're aggressive, your, your level of anger is probably going to increase and your, um, your, um, goals are, 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 let me prove myself or whatever it might be. And so actually you can say, uh, behavior, the person and the environment all mutually influence and change each other. Okay. So, um, Bandura's social cognitive theory, um, how do you apply it? Well, first off, if you're trying to shape another person's behavior or, or really even your own behavior, uh, it'd probably be best to use attractive models, um, models who will or reinforce to encourage behavior. So if you're trying to um, get a young child to behave a certain way, it'd probably be, it'd probably be helpful to um, have a, a cartoon character or someone who is interesting to them and, and fun for them to be able to, um, to copy. So the second application is to discourage behavior, you should use attractive models who are punished. Um, and to do that, you can use stories of hypothetical individuals, um, people that maybe they relate with. So um, again, for, for kids, you could use um, these people, uh, characters in, in really even cartoons who are uh, engaging in a bad behavior and have to face their consequences of it. Uh, teachers, uh, we know teachers use models extensively in the classroom. Sometimes that's just instructions. Okay. First, I want you to do this. Then I want you to do this. And, and that, that's a model for how they can behave. Um, the, the teacher's behaviors can also be a, a part of the modeling process. Um, so my, my daughter's been doing some, um, some uh, online learning and she's been working on a using an app to do that where she's learning the steps of addition learning a little differently than i learned it um, but if it was 38 plus uh, 36 uh, they teach them to go from 38 to the next 10 which would be 40 and so you have to add two and then to um, uh, 38 plus 36 uh, it'd be adding 30 after that so you go 40 plus 30 to 70 and then you have a six but you already used two so you have four left and it'd be 74 and so that uh, process they have like a graphic and animation to uh, uh, demonstrate that that's again the use of a model um, in terms of the classroom some classroom behaviors actually appear to be relatively uh, under relatively direct control of specific stimuli. So um, you probably know that there's some teachers that uh, have bells or buzzers or verbal signals. Uh, sometimes just the rules and routines are part of the, uh, the stimuli that keeps kids under control in the classroom. Uh, so some, some of it is under stimu uh, stimulus control. Sometimes it's under outcome control. Um, so praise, criticism, reinforcers, punishers, timeouts. Um, and then sometimes it seems to be stimulus or outcome control um, because the individual is starting to symbolize and anticipate the consequences of their behaviors. Now related to this topic of imitation is a interesting biological finding. Um, and uh, some Italian re scientists found this in the early or actually the, I think it was the late 90s, uh, they found in macaque monkeys, a type of monkey, a, uh, a neuron that they called mirror neurons that fired. Uh, these, are, these were neurons in the motor cortex. So they, they fired when the monkey was doing something, but they also remarkably found that the, this neuron that, was, again, it's a motor neuron, it's designed to 
to control our behaviors or the monkey's behaviors, uh, it also uh, fired when an action was observed. So it had dual purpose to fire when it is doing something and when it's observing. And so they called it a mirror neuron. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in mirror neurons. Um, and some have, have argued that mirror neurons could be actually the neural mechanism for imitation and empathy. So if I can watch someone else do something and actually experience it myself, and it, my brain is actually experiencing it very similarly as if I'm doing it myself, then it kind of blurs this line between me and you um, because you're doing it, but I'm also doing it, or at least my brain is doing it in just the exact same way that uh, I would if I was actually doing it. And so, um, again, that's sort of a key for imitation, uh, a key for um, reproducing an action. And some have even go gone as far to say this is the bedrock of empathy. Because if I experience something that you do, then perhaps that's how I empathize with you and emotionally connect with you. Um, now, um, there's been a lot of interest in it and a lot of excitement for it, uh, but sometimes the research, in fact, most of the time, the research is a little more guarded. Um, I'll encourage you to check out the video I posted there. I also posted it on Canvas, and it's a it's a interesting overview of mirror neurons that reminds us that maybe we should be a little bit more balanced when we think about it. Um, so some people can tell a story that mirror neurons are the the bedrock of empathy, but maybe that's not actually the case. Um, so uh, I think a little bit of skepticism might be in order for mirror neurons and uh, and yet still excited about them because there, there does seem to be some value to them. Um, in, in fact, Mirror neurons uh, do seem to be a potential candidate for, for autism, at least involved in some degree. And so if you're writing your clinical implications paper on, on autism, I encourage you to check out some of the research on autism and mirror neurons. Okay, so clinical applications. Um, in one of the things that Vander points out is if you engage people's imagination and their anticipation, it can actually impact their behavior. So some clinical problems can be the result of a failure to foresee uh, one's future. And so what you can do clinically is actually help people envision outcomes for their future that, that currently they're not capable of doing. Um, they might just be surviving the moment if you get them to imagine the future, then maybe they can start working towards it. So you might uh, do this with self-reflection, uh, to, to think about, imagine consequences, um, to, to imagine, okay, uh, how do you think you would uh, enjoy working as a uh, correctional officer? Might be one example. And uh, if you can also, another, application is if you can identify models that the client can imitate, then that can actually um, enable them to, uh, to pattern their behavior after that person. And that can include the therapist. So you, if you're a therapist, then you can actually be a model to them and say, okay, this is how I would handle this situation. And that could help them in their, their own problem solving. When I think about this spiritually, I think about actually um, Paul's admonition to uh, writing his letter. I forget what letter it was, but you encourage people to um, to uh, Paul imitate be imitators of him because he saw himself as an imitator of Christ, and uh, and so there's been uh, many people, many uh, faithful Christians over the years who have really um, um, it's, uh, it's been a long day. Um, there's been lots of Christians that have actually argued that we need to imitate Christ and imitate the saints because this is one of the ways that we deepen our own faith. And uh, if we pattern our life 
on the life of a saint or of Christ himself, maybe that's a great way for us to grow. Now, bringing it back to clinical, um, how do you help people with, uh, with this sort of modeling behavior? So we know that one treatment for snake phobias actually involves a person with a phobia being sh shown a model who uh, slowly approaches a snake. And what this is, is the, the person, the model may not actually have a, uh, sh they really shouldn't be a, have a phobia for themselves, but they can imitate fearful behavior so they could slowly approach the snake acting terrified and maybe even going into a panic and moving away. Um, but uh, but they, they, they do slowly approach the snake, then they open the cage, they remove the snake, they sit down in a chair, they dra drape the snake around his or her neck, and then uh, as they're doing this, they give themselves uh, calming instructions. Uh, believe it or not, this intervention actually can help people who have a snake phobia learn how to interact with a snake. So you get them to pay attention to the model's behavior, to um, retain it, to be able to re reproduce it. I mean, this is all pretty simple stuff. And then get them motivated to actually do it for themselves. And they, they now have a, a, an example of someone who moved from feeling scared to actually being able to interact with the snake and sort of have a, a, a visual representation of, oh, okay, if I'm scared, here's how I can shift and change from feeling scared to feeling a little bit more comfortable. So um, I think that's it, yep. And so I'm gonna end there. Hopefully you've enjoyed these videos and found them helpful. Um, and it's been a pleasure to teach you virtually through the, these videos, these YouTube videos. Hopefully, um, hopefully we'll cross paths in the future. Uh, take care of yourself and um, yeah. Uh, and good luck with finishing up the course and doing well and wrapping this all up. So take care. All right.